We're in the book of Nehemiah, and uh, we should finish the book this evening, the book of Nehemiah, 9 through 11 in this session, and then we'll have an additional session for the remaining two chapters, 12 and 13. And that will complete the uh, string of historic, so-called historical books of the Old Testament. Just a little bit by way of review, obviously the Babylonian captivity, which, took, which, which was done in three sieges, um, launching the servitude of the nation. Second Chronicles and Second Kings brought us to the threshold of that, where they went into the Babylonian captivity. And uh, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel were the prophets in those days. But now we're out of the Babylonian captivity. The, the, the Cyrus came, and uh, uh, he's, a, he's an incredible guy, the Gentile king, whose name was announced in the Scripture two centuries before the fact. And he finds this letter written to him in Isaiah, uh, and, uh, in which he takes God's challenge and refrees. When he conquers Babylon, he frees the Jews to go home. In fact, gives them financial incentives. Only about less than 50,000 went with Zerubbabel to the... Uh, so that launched the Persian, uh, Persian Empire, of course, but it, it took uh, about 40, well, roughly 50,000 to go with Zerubbabel to begin with, and then some years later, Ezra brings another couple of thousand. The prophet Haggai is uh, operative in this period, and now we've finished Ezra, which he, he was the priest, and he focused on the rebuilding of the temple, but the real problem in a... In a, in a uh, social, political sense, was they couldn't defend themselves. They had to build the wall. So Nehemiah, who was, in, who was the cupbearer to the king and apparently had a great relationship with King Artaxerxes, got permission to rebuild the city. Very, very key milestone because that, trigger, that decree of Artaxerxes it, it ends the desolations of Jerusalem. Servitude of the nation and desolation of Jerusalem are both 70 years, but they're not coterminous. The servitude starts with the first siege and ends with the decree of Cyrus. The desolations of Jerusalem start with the third siege of Nebuchadnezzar in which he levels the city of Jerusalem and uh, goes to the decree of Artaxerxes. Also 70 years. Both of these 70-year periods are to the day, which is astonishing in itself. And, uh, and of course, the decree of Artaxerxes triggers the 70 weeks of Daniel. We covered that when we covered Nehemiah chapter 2. That's just by way of quick background. Between Ezra chapter 6 and 7, we insert the book of Esther. It doesn't show up in the book, but that's historically where it occurred. Again, during the Persian Empire and, and her... Uh, the drama of Esther uh, saved the Jews from extinction, extinction. Haman being a Hitler type of character, the villain of the piece. Anyway, and Zechariah and Malachi are the prophets uh, over Nehemiah. We're not sure exactly where Malachi fits. We know it's somewhere during the, it's, it's from the content we know it's in the days of uh, uh, Nehemiah, but scholars argue about exactly where. So in 538, 49, about 50,000 came from Jerubble, under Zerubbabel. Twenty-three years later, the temple was finally built under Ezra, and uh, I, I should say in the book of Ezra. Ezra shows up 57 years later himself personally, and he documents all that. Uh, so there's uh, roughly 52,000 that are accounted for, uh, plus some of those that aren't recorded. Esther is there right in the middle of that, just to give you a quick historical snapshot. And, uh, of course, now we're uh, in the book of Nehemiah, which is about 13 years later. And he obtains authority for Jerusalem, and we've been going through the book. And the key king here is Artaxerxes I, sometimes called Artaxerxes Langemanus, and he's the one whose authority makes possible the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. There are four decrees you'll find in study Bibles and so forth, but three of the four have to do with the temple, only one with the city, and that's what the angel Gabriel had, had mentioned to Daniel uh, centuries before, would, be, would trigger the counting that would predict the exact day that Jesus Christ would present himself as king, riding a donkey into Jerusalem. Great study, uh, just by way of review. But we're in ne Nehemiah chapter 9, so let's just jump in here. Um, now on the 20 and 4th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquity of their fathers. So we're celebrating here, as you may recall from the last time, the Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Booths. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day, and another fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. So that's, uh, that's serious. For about three hours they stood as, while the law was read. That's pretty amazing. Most people 
after 50 or 60 minutes, sitting in their seats start squirming. You know, I don't know if, maybe we're doing this wrong. Maybe I should have you stand for uh, three hours. Maybe that would be more effective. Anyway, <laughs> relax. We won't try that. Um, anyway, uh, for then for another three hours, they confess their sins. That's where we'd have a problem. It'd probably take us more than three hours to go through all our sins. But anyway, uh, and I don't mean to be flippant, but it's, uh, you have to, it, it, is, it is impressive. These, uh, they're, they're, in other words, uh, they, they, the nation is back out of captivity. They now have a temple so they can reinstitute their, their uh, Mosaic Judaism. And, I'll, and I, as I mentioned that, I should point out, when you use the term Judaism, you, in, you invite some real confusion. Because today, what, you, what we know as Judaism is Talmudic Judaism that derives from the, in the, during the first century, the, the Council of Yamne. You have to understand that uh, Judaism has a... In 70 AD, the Jews had a real problem. Because the Torah, the books, of, the, the books of the law, point out that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Well, they have no place to shed blood. There's no temple, there's no altar, etc. They got a problem. And it's not a temporary thing that's out for a few weeks... It was gone. And so they end up, in effect, I don't mean to be uh, unjust, I don't mean to be too cavalier about it, but they basically re-rationalized their form of worship into a work strip to somehow do good as a compensation. And Talmudic Judaism, the kind of Judaism in its various forms today, is quite different than the Mosaic Judaism as outlined in the Torah, if you're strict about it. And so you need to, uh, uh, when you, if you get into that, be careful with your terminology. It's very fascinating to me in Russia, I uh, discovered there was a group called the Karaites. And the Karaites, this is in about the 6th century on, as I recall. I forget the dates, I'm doing it from memory. But uh, they, uh, they were a group of Jews, settlements, Jewish settlements in Russia, that insisted upon rejecting Talmudic Judaism and staying with Mosaic Judaism. And because they separated themselves from their Jewish friends, being very strict about their observance, the czar didn't treat them, I mean, didn't, didn't impose upon them all the burdens they put on the Talmudic Judaism. The double taxation, the pogroms, all the abuses, they were exempt from. I think there's an irony there that's rather, you know, uh, provocative um, because they were uh, 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 not identified by the czar as part of the, the problem, if you will. So that uh, I thought was rather interesting. And I don't know how many of those groups, you know, survived through... The, you know, it's made, we tend to map history by the major, major movements. If you read a, a history of, uh, uh, of Europe, they speak of Christianity, what they really mean is Roman Catholicism. To, to, to a secular mind, it's you know, part of the same package. But if you're dis- biblically discerning, there's a huge difference because there were more Christians murdered by one pope in one afternoon than all the Roman Caesars put together because the, the bloody, the, you won't understand the history of Europe unless you understand the struggle of, for temporal power by the Vatican. But the point is, it's probably this very similar thing within Judaism because we think of Judaism in its traditional forms. There were probably pockets of Jews that uh, clung to the Mosaic Judaism uh, throughout the centuries. Anyway, moving on. Got off the subject here a little. Uh, let's see, we got all the way down to verse 4, didn't we? Uh, then stood up upon the stairs of the Levites, Jeshua and Bani, Kadmiel, Shebani, uh, Muni, Sherebiah, Bani, and Chenani, and cried with a loud voice unto the Lord their God. Now, this chapter will be like some of the others we've had. There's going to be lots of lists of names. And you wonder, what on earth is in those lists of names? Now, actually, you can pick out some of those and make an interesting study behind them if you want to take the effort. But the other real point that... Uh, it occurred to me not that I didn't make before, and I probably should, is uh, these people are recorded in here because of what they did. Some were Levites, priests, singers, whatever. And they were, their names are recorded in the Word of God. And you sort of say, gee, what's the point? I mean, uh, we're going through this. It may have been important to them, important back then. Why is it important to us? Well, there's probably a number of lessons, one of which is to realize God still keeps His records. And your name is in his book. If you're in Christ, your name is in the book of life. The things you've done for him, the thing that pleases God, are recorded. They may not be in your Bible, but they will be recorded in heaven. And so as we see these names and realize that to us, these are ancient names long past, no, no, if they're in, if they're, we're going to meet these people. Uh, and likewise, there are uh, our efforts, the fruits of our efforts, 
are also a matter of God's record. So we might keep that in mind. Anyway, verse 5, then the Levites, Joshua, Kadmiel, Bene, Hashaman, a bunch of the other names I'm mispronouncing, Hodijah, Shebaniah, Pedathiah, uh, said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. These are several of these Levites, some were mentioned back in chapter 8, uh, were involved in leading the people, of course, in this praise. Five of the eight Levites are listed in the group of eight in verse five. Anyway, the, uh, they, may, they may have been the same or they may have been different men. We're not sure. But um, these are on the stairs or literally the ascent, if you will. Some part of the temple complex had a, a, a rise there, if you will. Now, from verse uh, five on till about verse, uh, till, till, well, actually all the way until a, a good part of the way in chapter 10 is follows a structure of a covenant form. There's a preamble of a couple of verses, 5 and 6. Then there's a historical prologue from verses 7 through 37 where they recount all the things God has done for them. And then from verse 38 into about, for the next, from about verse 20, uh, 38 in chapter 9 down to verse 29 in chapter 10, there is the acceptance of a covenant. They're going to agree to a covenant in writing. And uh, we'll talk about that as we go. And then there's some stipulations at the end that uh, finishes chapter 10. Now, these, uh, the, these first uh, uh, half a dozen verses for, through 31 are voiced by the Levites on behalf of the nation. And, of course, it'll recount the major events in Israel's history. And we could spend three weeks if we want to take each verse and break it down. But I'm going to assume, for most of you, this should be familiar ground. If not, you, can, you should know enough at this point with your Bible to be able to track down the background in your own study. Let's go to verse 6. So they continue, Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with their, all their host, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein. And thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. Thou art the Lord, the God, who didst choose Abram, who brought us him forth out of Ur the Chaldees, and gave us the name of Abraham. And I think we've covered that before, that when you change Abram to Abraham, all you do is add a he, which is one of the 22 Hebrew letters, in the middle of the name. The he is a breath. It's like, an, it's like our H, very, very similar. You remember, uh, if you remember uh, Eliza Doolittle in... Uh, Thank you, my fair lady, um, or, or Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, the play. Um, Henry Higgins, the tutor, made Eliza Doolittle. Per, she, she, being a Cockney, she didn't have H's, so he had, she had to learn how to make H's. So she had a, you know, an, in Hartford, Hereford, and Hampshire, hurricanes hardly happen. And she had to say that to blow out a flame and so on. So uh, uh, that, that's that, that same exercise to pronounce English properly uh, is what uh, the he requires in the Hebrew. The point is the he is a breath which is synonymous with spirit. The pneuma in the Greek or the ruach in the Hebrew is breath or wind or spirit. Same, same word. So what God did by changing Abraham to Abraham, he infused in him the spirit of God. And that's why it's pronounced differently in the, in the breath. Same with Sarai, uh, to Sarai to Sarai, just adding a, a, a hey again. I'm always fascinated by that, that uh, in the Hebrew, the letters of the alphabet, the 22 letters of the alphabet, are not only phonetic, like in most languages, they're conceptual. And the first letter is an aleph, which is it supposed to look like sort of long herd, a skull of a cattle, an ox. So it represents strength, or since it's the first letter, leadership. And uh, the second letter is like, looks like a little teepee on a line. It's, it's, it later became our B, but it, flat it was called a bet, a beth, which means house, Bethlehem, house of bread, beth, the letter beth. Uh, uh, an aleph and a beth is the leader of the house. It's the name for father, Ab or Abba. Huh? If you put a he in the middle of it, you get the essence of the father. So Ahab is the essence of the father. It's the Hebrew word for love which is the essence of the Father. So as you start getting into this, it blows you away to realize that this language is vastly more complicated than the, the very rigorous, very precise languages that we're used to. Like Greek is far more precise than, than probably any other language on the planet Earth. Larger vocabulary, the, gram, the gr- grammatical rules are incredibly strict. Therefore, it's incredibly descriptive 
in terms of precision or engineering or what have you. But there's a richness of expression conceptually in the Hebrew, the second one. It also lends itself to encryption and bandwidth compression, and that's a whole other thing. I don't want to get in my PhD there. Let's go get back here. Anyway, uh, we got all the way down to verse 7. We're doing great. Verse 8, and found, us, and found us his heart faithful before thee. Continuing what God has been doing for them and talking about Abraham. Found us his heart faithful before thee and made us a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and the Gergesites. To give it, I say, to his seed and hast performed thy words, for thou art righteous. And didst see the affliction of our fathers in Egypt. Now he's shifting from Abraham now to the days of Pharaoh and so on. Thou didst see the affliction of our fathers in Egypt, and heardest thy cry by the Red Sea, and showedest signs and wonders upon Pharaoh and upon all his servants, upon all the people of his land. For thou knewest that they dealt proudly against them, so didst thou get thee a name as it is this day. You know, it's interesting how repeatedly throughout the entire Bible, one of the medals, so to speak, idiomatically speaking, on, on the chest of God is this whole issue of what happened in the Red Sea in, in Egypt. The Bible is full of miracles, many dramatic ones, but it's interesting to notice how that particular drama that we're all familiar with becomes a major emblem or uh, identity piece, if you will, with the God of the universe. It's interesting how that has been elevated to something far more than it would seem on the face of it, it miraculous though it was and so on. Anyway, moving on, verse 11. And thou didst divide the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on the dry land. And their persecutors thou threwest into the deeps as a stone into the mighty waters. You know, I'm always amused by the skeptics who say, well, there was a big wind and certain times of the year, this particular region, which they can't identify, by the way, but they say this particular region uh, only had a few feet of water. See, they're asking for a bigger miracle than they record in the Bible. They're, they're saying that the entire Egyptian army drowned in three feet of water. You know, it doesn't quite compute if you follow me. Okay. So anyway, let's move on. Verse 12, Moreover thou lettest them in a day by the cloudy pillar and in the night by a pillar of fire to give them light in the way wherein they should go. What is that pillar called? Come on, gang. Shekinah. Or Shekinah or Shekinah, or however you bet. And a cloudy, cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Thou camest down. Oh, and by the way, because we're going to get into this later, while they're wandering the wilderness, the Shekinah was a cloud... During the day, pillar of fire by night. Where was it when the temple was built? Above the ark, in the Holy of Holies. You betcha. That's going to be important too as we get later. Let's move on. Verse 13. Thou camest down also upon the Mount Sinai. See, now it's shifting again at the Ten Commandments. We're now at Exodus 19. And spakest with them from heaven and gavest them right judgments and true laws and good statutes and commandments. And if you're in, in a school situation, you'll have to discern the difference between judgments, laws, statutes, and commandments. They're not the same thing if you want to be pr- academic about it. But as far as you and I are concerned, I think we both understand you're supposed to follow them, whatever they are. Okay. And made us known of them by thy holy Sabbath, and commandest them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, thy servant, and gave us them bread from heaven for their hunger, and brought us forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And promised them that they should go in to possess the land which thou hast sworn to give them. So there we have the manna, of course. And we have the smiting of the rock, which happened twice, you may recall. And uh, so on. So just a a quick summary here of their history. But they and our fathers dealt proudly. uh Uh-oh. And hardened their necks. And hearkened not to thy commandments. And refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and for six and not. It's interesting, I can remember when the Ten Commandments movie first came out as a movie, uh, we had some discussions with some friends of ours that weren't believers particularly, they weren't, they were, if if anything, maybe just denominational uh, Christians, but uh, they were really stunned by the portrayal in the Ten Commandments, the realization that after all these things that happened, you know, they had all the miracles of the ten plagues, and then they had the death of the firstborn, and then they're on their way out there. And the first little thing, uh, Dathan, you know, organizes a rebellion. We've got to go back to, they want to go back to Egypt. 
people, uh, very common, couldn't believe that this, this, this people, having seen firsthand these incredible dramatic episodes, would not be totally absorbed with God and, and would be so ready to go back to the bondage of Egypt. And, of course, the Bible portrays them as a stiff-necked people and so forth. But you know what's interesting? As we watch them, and as we look at them maybe critically, we, <laughs> we need to look in the mirror. Because whatever they've seen, we have record of. And on top of that, we have so much more. We have so much more to be thankful for than they did. And um, still, we find it convenient to put it on the back burner. And it's maybe, you know, it's item nine on a list of ten. It's not, it should be item one on a list of one is what it should be. Anyway, moving on. Okay, verse 18. Yea, when they had made them a molten calf and said, This is thy God that brought thee out of Egypt and had wrought great provocations. By the way, can you imagine how God must have felt about that? After all this you know, almost deliberate drama, God almost, you know, uh, he's got Pharaoh where he's, you know, he's almost creating the excuse to show himself strong, you know. And, and after this dramatic demonstration that he's the God of Israel and, and he, he succeeds in getting them uh, miraculously delivered through the Red Sea, they're now at Sinai and so forth. And uh, so the minute he and Moses go off from the hill to talk a little bit, <laughs> Come down, they're making a golden calf, which is a symbol, of, among other things, of going back to Egypt, worshiping the, the culture and the background that they came from. Astonishing. You know, there, there, there's no way, I think, for you and I to understand the insanity of paganism. There's no way we can understand the bloodshed that's been spilled before idols. Um, astonishing, and yet uh, that's the, that's the, that's that's man's history. Anyway, they, they continue with uh, even though that they went out of their way to provoke God, He says, "Yet thou in thy manifold mercies." I want you to know. By the way, you notice even in the Old Testament, if you watch for it, it underscores that God is a God of mercy. There is a myth that runs around by the naive, superficial reader that the God of the Old Testament is a vengeful God, and the God of the New Testament is love and so forth. No, there's one God. He changes not. And we need to understand His whole nature. And not just His, not any kind of uh, casual permissiveness. That's not what His mercy is all about. His mercy is a very passionate love. And the predicament that was solved at the cross was not just ours, it was His. Because He wants to love us, but He can't violate His justice. And so as you really understand that. But as you go through the Bible, especially the Old Testament, watch and realize how it underscores again and again and again that God is a God of mercy. And he, anyway, they continue to praise here, saying, Yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way wherein they should go. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them, and withheldest not thy manna from their mouth, and gavest them water for their thirst. Yea, for forty years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness, so that they lacked nothing. Their clothes waxed not old, and their feet swelled not. And there's other passages say their shoes did not wear out. Forty years! Johnson Murphy, eat your heart out. No, there we go. Moreover, thou gavest them kingdoms and nations, and didst divide them into corners, so they possessed the land of Sihon, and the land of king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, the king of Bashan. Now those of you that are in research moods, check out Bashan, and the king of Bashan, and find out who he was. He was the king of the giants. He was a Nephilim, called a Rephaim in that language. And a very, very interesting background there. Very spooky stuff. These are the unsavable ones. These are the, the Rephaim cannot rise, Isaiah tells us. And that leads a mystery that I have yet to find anyone really to solve. When Jesus Christ is hanging on the cross, as exemplified by the words in Psalm 22, he says, The bulls of Bashan have encompassed me about. What on earth is he talking about? You talking about the cattle from the Golan Heights? No. He's talking about demon spirits of some kind. 
Spooky stuff if you peel the onion and get into it. But let's move on. Verse 23, Their children also multipliest thou as the stars of heaven. That's a bunch, gang. As the stars of heaven. And broughtest them into the land concerning which thou hast promised to their fathers that they should go in to possess it. A small point, probably debatable, but I'll share it with you so you can't, when you encounter it, won't be surprised. The scripture seems to indicate that the descendants of Abraham are as the sand of the sea and the stars in the heaven. Both phrases are used of the descendants of Abraham. They may be just figures of speech, nothing more, but some scholars suggest the possibility that the sand of the sea are the earthly descendants of Abraham and the stars of the heaven are the the uh, uh, faithful that embrace the faith of Abraham. You can support that. Uh, it's more a conjecture, but it's, it's supportable from some passages. But it's uh, uh, splitting hairs, perhaps. Verse 24, So the children of Israel went in and possessed the land, and thou subduest them uh, before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gavest them into their hands with their kings and the people of the land, that they might do with them as they would. Now, this is, of course, talking about the conquest of Joshua. You'll discover that the Canaanites are often listed with seven tribes. But they're also used connotatively for the whole bunch. Just as Ephraim is one of the twelve tribes, the term Ephraim is also used as a, as a label for the whole northern kingdom sometimes. And uh, so don't be thrown. Just like Judah is sometimes used, not just for the tribe of Judah, but Benjamin and Simeon as, in a colloquial sense, or Judah in a broader sense for the whole nation. So remember, it, it depends on the context. But anyway, uh, the Canaanites use it the same way. So, Okay, so, and they took strong cities and a fat land and possessed houses full of goods and wells digged, vineyards and olive yards and fruit trees in abundance. So they did eat and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in thy great goodness. Now when you read that with spiritual insight... You don't even have to look at the next verse to know what follows. What happens when we are filled and become fat and we're delighted in great goodness? That's called abundance. And after abundance comes apathy. And after apathy comes what? Dependence. After dependence, bondage. So they're bondage. So it goes on verse 26. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law behind their backs. And they slew thy prophets. God sent them messengers. Instead of receiving them, they killed them. And Jesus even makes reference to this. They slew thy prophets, which testified against them to turn them to thee. And they wrought great provocations. As we look at these people, we're shocked. As we understand the record of their history, we're appalled. And yet we should be careful when we look in the mirror. Because we're guilty of the same thing. Maybe not quite as dramatically but every, but every bit is guilty. Therefore thou deliverest them into the hand of their enemies who vexed them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, thou heardst them from heaven, and according to thy manifold mercies, there it is again, thou gavest them saviors. Now, of course, the ultimate savior is included, but he's also using this in a broader sense. He's speaking of the deliverances during the time of the judges, who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest... They did evil again before thee. Therefore leftest thou them in the hand of their enemies, so that they had the dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and many times didst thou deliver them according to thy mercies. And that's the echo again and again and again throughout the book of Judges. And of course, it's also the history of the nation as a whole. Verse 29, and testified, and testifies against them that thou mightest bring them again into thy law, unto thy law. Yet they dealt proudly, and hearken not unto thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. And withdrew the shoulder, and hardened their neck, and would not hear. Yet many years didst thou forbear them, and testified against them by thy spirit and thy prophets. Yet would they not give ear. Therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the lands. Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for thou art, what? A gracious and merciful God. Boy, is that underscored again and again all through the book of Deuteronomy, among other places. Verse 32, Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, the terrible God, and the word terrible there is like awesome. <laughs> I'm reminded I have to be reading today, 
you know, uh, we don't use it much in our language too much, but some people still like speak of the reverend so-and-so, the reverend so-and-so. The word means terrible. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and, and <laughs> so uh, fortunately no one uses that around here. I hope, I hope they don't start. Uh, uh, the reverend so-and-so. You know, it, it's, it's, it, it, if you understand the meaning of the word, it's not complimentary. Anyway, in both respects, what the word literally means, and also it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, God is what's reverend, period. And we now therefore our God the great, the mighty, the terrible God, who keepest covenant and mercy, let not all the trouble seem a little before thee that hath come upon us, on our kings, on our princes, and our priests, and on our prophets, and our fathers, and on all thy people, since the time of the kings of Assyria unto this day. Boy, um, <laughs> I've been skimming through my notes, but we don't need notes. This is pretty, this is pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, the Assyrian allusion here is that it was the next great power after Egypt. We are familiar with Egypt. We've been talking about Egypt, Pharaoh, and so forth. Then came the era of the Assyrians. And so the shadow of the Assyrians were over the whole nation, even up until 721 when the northern kingdom finally gets taken captive. But, so it's idiomatic. It's, in broad, it's used as a synecdoche, a part from the whole or a whole from the part. Verse 33, How be it thou art just in all that is brought upon us, for thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. Neither have our kings, our princes, our priests, nor our fathers kept thy law, nor hearkened unto thy commandments and thy testimonies, wherewith thou didst testify against them. For they have not served thee in their kingdom, and in thy great goodness that thou gavest them, and in the large and fat land which thou gavest before them, neither turned they from their wicked works. What's with these people? Verse 36, Behold, we are servants this day, and for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. And it yieldeth much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. And because of all this we make a sure covenant, and we write it, and our princes and Levites and priests seal unto it. Now what's going to follow here is a written covenant. They entered into a covenant at Sinai, obviously, but here they're, entering, they're re-entering, so to speak, and they're going to put this all down, and they're going to swear to it. Is it going to make a difference? Second and third guesses don't count, right? Okay. So let's go to chapter 10 and see what happens here. Now those that sealed it were, and we're going to have a list of names here, of people that sealed this uh, covenant. Now, these are the sealed were Nehemiah. He's the first one in the, out of the, the list here. The uh, Tersha, Tershatha, that's a title, incidentally. And the son of Hakali and uh, Zedekiah and uh, Zariah and Azariah and Jeremiah, Pasher. That's not the Jeremiah of, of the captivity. It's, I believe it's a different one. Maybe Amariah, Malchiah, Hattush, Shebaniah, um, Malak, Harim, Merimoth, Obadiah, Daniel, Ginnathon, Baruch, Meshalem, Abijah, Midjanin, Maaziah, Bilgai, Shemaiah. These were the priests. Okay, good start. And the Levites. Um, we have both Jeshua, the son of Azaniah, Minui, the sons of Henadad, Cadmiel, uh, and their brethren, uh, Shebaniah, Hadajiah, Kelida, Peliah, Hanan, Micah, Rehob, Hashabiah, Zakur, Shebaniah, Hadashai, Bani, and Biniu. Um, again, for us, it seems very remote. Why are these? You know, the, the real point, one of our points to take here is that this is just God keeping records, and He keeps records on each one of us. These happen to be here in the Word. And we're continuing, verse 14. The chief of the people, Parosh, Pahathamoeb, Elam, Zathu, Bani, Buni, Azagad, Babai, Adonijah, Bigvai, Adin, Ater, Hik, uh, uh, Hizkaiha, Azur, Hodijah, Hashum, Bejai, Harif, Anathoth. I'm going to come back to that one. Nabai, Magpayash, Meshulam, Hazer, Meshazabil, Zadok, Yadua, Pelatiah, 
Hanan, Ananiah, Hosea, Hananiah, Hasheb, Halo, Shesh, uh, Pelhea, Shobek, Rehum, Hashabna, Messiah, and uh, Ahijah, Hanan, Anan, Malak, Harim, Bana. You know, you say, gee, check, why are you reading it? You're not pronouncing it right in the first place, and why do that? Well, it's a tough thing because I don't have a lot to contribute here. I'll pick one thing to talk about, but um, uh, it's sort of resolved. I'm either going to go through it verse by verse with you, cover to cover, or I'm going to skip. And once I start skipping, where do you draw the line? You see, so I'm just, uh, it seems appropriate to at least make an effort here. But I want to talk about a name that leaps out here, uh, Anathoth. You wonder, what is this about? This has occurred now about three times in these lists. Uh, it came up first in Ezra. It came up before in, uh, in uh, uh, Nehemiah. And it came up again. And uh, it's just, it, it gives rise to an event that occurred in the days of Jeremiah that we should look at. When you think of Anathoth, if you read your Bible out, you meet, the man from Anathoth was Jeremiah, the first verse of the prophet Jeremiah. He was the prophet from Anathoth. And it, re, it becomes a label of his all through his book. But an event occurs in Jeremiah 32 that when you're reading through Jeremiah, you wonder, what on earth was that all about? It's one of these little tidbits, and I think you've learned by now that behind any of these things, there's usually a discovery. So let me pause for a minute and take a quick look at Jeremiah 32. For those of you following your own Bibles, turn to Jeremiah 32. We're going to go from verse 6 and following for a few verses. No, Jeremiah is asked to do a strange thing, and of course, by faith, he does it. Jeremiah 32, verse 6. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying... So notice what he's about to do, strange as it may seem, is something God told him to do. So he does it. Verse 7. Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field that is an Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. Now, understand the picture here. He's got an uncle that owns a piece of property. Jeremiah fully understands that the nation is about to go into captivity for 70 years. That's not a very good thing for the real estate market. You follow me? And so, but God's telling him to go, go buy this. So, go, buy thee the, my field, that is in Anathoth. Or he's, he's, he's pointing out that Hanamiel, uh, his uncle, is going to come, he's going to try to pawn off this land. Buy thee my field, which is an Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. In other words, he has the right to because he's of that tribe. See, Baron, it's a tribal area, so in order to buy it, he had to be in the proper lineage and all that. So he's going to buy it. So, okay. So Hanamiel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison. See, <laughs> Jeremiah is in prison. They think he's a traitor because he keeps saying you should yield to Nebuchadnezzar. Anyway, according to the word of the Lord, and he said unto me, Buy my field, I pray thee, that is an Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin. For the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then I knew that this was a word of the Lord. In other words, God had told him to do that. When his uncle does come and offer it, and he realized, okay, for whatever reason, God wants me to do it. So he's, he's going to shell out what I, you know, his real money to buy this land that he'll never live to see and may never again. And you know, the concept is that it's down the drain from his point of view. And I bought the field of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, that was in Athoth, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. And I subscribed the evidence and sealed it and took witnesses and weighed him the money in the balances. Now, the way this works is they will take a deed for the land. He'll pay the uncle for the title to the land, for the, for the deed. And then on the outside of the scroll, they'll write the requirements to redeem it. And they'll put, hide, put this in a jar somewhere and hide it so that after the 70 years captivity, they can come back and who, his descendants, whoever comes back, they can prove he's entitled can, by conforming to the information on the outside of the scroll, um, they, they, they'll, they'll have this land. So he says, so I took the evidence of the purchase, both at that which was sealed according to the law and custom and that which was open. See, they make two copies. One is sealed and put in a typically a jar and, and hidden somewhere in a trade or in some special place. And I gave evidence of the purchase unto Baruch, the son of Neriah, the son of Messiah, in the sight of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, and the presence of the witnesses that subscribed the book of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. Okay, that all sounds pretty good, doesn't it, huh? 
And I charged Baruch before them, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these evidences, these scrolls, this evidence of purchase, both which is sealed and this evidence which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days. And that's it. Now, what are, you're going to Jeremiah, it goes on to other subjects now. What on earth is this all about? Now, if you're a normal, well-adjusted person, you read that and shrug and move on. But if you've been to one of my Bible studies, you're no longer a normal, well-adjusted person. <laughs> you realize I have this preposterous viewpoint that every detail in the Scripture is there by divine design. And Paul confirms this. Whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning that we, through the comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope, right? So why is this here? I'm bringing it up, of course, because we're in Nehemiah and the remnant are returning. They've established the temple. They've established the city of Jerusalem. They're back in business. And among them, we assume, there is a descendant of Jeremiah. And he will dig up these vessels. He'll encounter the evidences, the scrolls. He'll comply with the requirements to prove that he's of the line and so forth. And he owns that land. You follow me? Now why does God want you to know that? For two reasons. One is to give you a little perception of how they dealt with land. Because see, the land didn't belong to anybody. It belonged to God. It was assigned by tribe. They were tenant. They really, it technically is what we would classify as a lease. But let's not get into that right now. So what does this got to do with anything? Well, let's go see what John tells us. John goes to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. John says, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne. He's in heaven, ruler of the universe. I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside. Oh, why is it written on the backside? Because it's a title deed. And it was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? And there's this heavy, terrible sentence. And no man in heaven, nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither look thereon. It had to be a kinsman. It had to be a kinsman of Adam, because this is a title deed to the earth. But no man in heaven or earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither look thereon. That's the general. There's an exception, fortunately, because the next verse, John, you and I don't understand this, but John did. The scripture says, I sobbed convulsively, is what the Greek actually says. I I wept much, in the King James. I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither look thereon. Huh. But one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Boy, that's great. Who is the lion of the tribe of Judah? Jesus. It's interesting. John hears that as the title. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. And then he turns to look, and what does he see? I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, guess what he saw? Stood the Lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And the book, the book of Revelation continues, as he opens the seven seals, taking possession of that which he purchased some 2,000 years ago on a wooden cross erected in Judea. He's purchased it. He owns it. He's going to take possession and dispossess the land of the usurpers. And that's what the Revelation deals with from chapter 5 through chapter 19 when we see the King of kings and Lord of lords make his victory appearance. It all derives from this little episode back in Nehemiah 27. Anyway, let's move on. And the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, and the Nethanims, and all they that had separated themselves from the people of the lands unto the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, every one having knowledge and having understanding, they clave to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and unto, into an oath 
to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe to, and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and His judgment and statutes. When it says curse, it doesn't mean they didn't curse Him. They invoke the curse that God had announced back in, in, the, in, the, in the Torah, if you will. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't get confused on that, that point, if I, if, I, if I may. So... Um, the rest of the people, and, and, and that we would not give our daughters unto the, land, uh, the people of the land, nor take of their daughters for our sons. That was they, they, they enumerate the various commitments they're making here. The, um, so they're all binding themselves, in effect, in writing. The curse, by the way, if those of you want to chase that down, is, is in Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 through 68. So it's not something I'm making up. So and, and we would not give our daughters unto the people of the land, nor take their daughters. They want to keep separate, you see. And if the people of the land bring ware or any victuals on the Sabbath day to sell, that we would not buy it of them on the Sabbath or on a holy day, that we should leave the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. Also we made ordinances for us to charge ourselves yearly with a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of earth. You know, getting back to the, uh, one small thing, on this uh, Sabbath year, every seventh year, all debts were forgiven. That was Israel's approach to giving someone a clean start. It intrigues me to discover that in the Christian community, there are many Christians that don't honor the laws of bankruptcy. What I mean by that is they, you know, the, law of, the laws of the land are that if you go through bankruptcy, you are debt-free when you come out. And uh, uh, having gone through that back 10 years ago, uh, it su- surprises me to discover to, that... Uh, I, was, I, was, uh, I, I personally backed a public company that went down, and because it went down, I went down. I was trying to support it, I, foolish enough to try to support it myself, and obviously <laughs> got what I deserved. But uh, uh, of the shareholders that lost lots of money, investors that lost a lot of money, it's interesting that the secular shareholders shrugged it off. They knew it was a high-risk venture, and it was one of those things. You win, win a few, lose a few. But there's a very small number of Christians that were involved that still to this day are bitter because they feel I should somehow still, you know, come up with uh, $20 million and pay off the shareholders and so forth. That's their concept. And uh, I suppose if, I was, if there was some conceptual way of doing that, I'd be probably tempted to, but it's obviously not. That's part of what bank- bankruptcy is about, is r- erasing the blackboard, getting a clean start. And that's biblical. That's what they did in Israel. And that's why it surprises me to discover that the intolerance of that approach, a new start approach, comes, strangely enough, from uh, uh, a, a, uh, the Christian community, which is strange. We, that's one of the things we probably should uh, um, document more thoroughly. The whole experience of going through the bankruptcy was a very, very interesting experience. The people that we thought were close friends weren't. The people who we never met rallied around us and saw us through. Uh, it was a very interesting lesson on what's real and who, are, who put shoe leather to the faith. It was an interesting time. And... Uh, I can remember vividly um, Hal and his wife coming in and giving us a $50,000 check and saying, this is not a loan, it's a gift. We know you're in trouble, you need it. And how, how different that was right up front. There was no, no ifs, but you, know, you, you, you understand people who understand in times like that. Moving on, verse 32. Also we made ordinance for us to charge ourselves yearly with a third part of a shekel for the service of uh, the house of our God. And uh, that's the, uh, this, uh, this half shekel annually uh, in Exodus 30 is where that, in verse 11 and following, is where that's, that's part of the Torah. For the showbread and for the continual meat offering and for the continual burnt offering of the Sabbaths and of the new moons, for the set feasts and for the holy things and for the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of God. In other words, they're going to support their religious establishment as the Torah provides. That's what they're committing to. And they're committing to all this in writing, Okay. And we cast lots among the priests and the Levites and the people for the wood offering and uh, to bring it to the house of our God after the houses of our fathers at, at times appointed year by year to burn upon the altar of the Lord our God as is written in the law and to bring first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all the fruit trees year by year into the house of the Lord. And also the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle as is written in the law and the firstlings of our herds and of our flocks to bring to the house of our God unto the priests that minister to the house of our God. That we should bring the first fruits of our dough, our offerings, the fruit of all manner of trees and of wine and of oil, and unto the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God, and the tithes of our ground, unto the Levites, 
that the, that the same Levites might have the tithes in all the cities of our tillage. The priest of the son of Aaron shall be with the Levites, and when the Levites shall t- t- take tithes, and the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes, the tithe of the tithes, in other words, unto the house of our God, to the chambers, uh, into the treasure house. We're going to talk about those chambers in the next session. For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the corn, of the new wine, the oil, and the chambers, which are the vessels of the sanctuary, and the priests that minister, and the porters, and the singers, and we will not forsake the house of our God. So this is the stipulations that they're they're, uh, committing themselves to. Chapter 11. And the rulers of the people dwelled in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine parts to dwell in other cities. So it seems they liked the suburbs. That was a popular option, apparently. Comparatively few people live in Jerusalem, partly because of the rubble. Remember in mind, this is just being, getting ready to be rebuilt. The walls are up. That helps the gates are repaired, so they have some, some security, but it has yet to be really occupied by people. So about one-tenth of them are to reside in Jerusalem, and uh, here it's called, incidentally, interestingly enough, the Holy City, which is an interesting label. And, uh, and, and so they drew lots to see who was going to do what here. So and the people blessed all the men that willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. Now these are the chief of the province that dwelt in Jerusalem, but in the cities of Judah dwelt every one in his possession in their cities, to wit Israel, the priests and the Levites and the Nethanims. Those are probably the descendants of the Gibeons, if you remember. And the uh, children of Solomon's servants. And at, Jeru- at Jerusalem dwelt certain of the children of Judah and of the children of Beth, uh, Benjamin, of the children of Judah, Athiah, the son of Uzziah, the son of Zechariah, the son of Amariah, the son of Shephatiah, the son of Mahalil, and the children of Perez, and the Messiah of the son of Baruch, and the son of Kol Jose, and the son of Isaiah, and the son of Adiah, and the son of Jairib, and the son of Zechariah, the son of Shiloni. You know, a lot of you have Bibles with pronunciation accents. Uh, I steer away from those because I find it simpler without them, but at times like this, I, would, I should have probably cheated. <laughs> Anyway, all the sons of Perez that dwelt in Jerusalem were 403 score and eight valiant men, and these are the sons of Benjamin, Salu, the son of Meshulam, the son of Joed, the son of Mediah, the son of Koliah, the son of Messiah, the son of Ethiel, the son of Jesse, and after him, Gabai, Salai, 928. I'm intrigued that God seems to be an accountant. He keeps track of all of us in detail. Now, in the notes that accompany these tapes, there'll be details how the reckoning in in First Chronicles or Second Chronicles is slightly different, and tried to, scholars have tried to explain where there seems to be they're relatively trivial variations, and most of them are explainable. Some are not. There's probably some some uh, it, you know scribal errors that have crept in, perhaps, but they're trivial, obviously, of, of any import. And uh, so, and Joel the son of Zikri was their overseer, and Judah the son of Zenua was the second over the city, and of the priests. Jedediah, the son of Joarib, and Yachin, Zariah, the son of Helkiah, the son of Meshulam, the son of Zadok, the son of Merarth, and the son of Ahitab, was the ruler of the house of God. So these are the priests, okay. And the brethren that did the work of the house were 822. Nadiah, the son of Jerome, the son of Pelila, the son of Amazi, the son of Zechariah, the son of Pasher, the son of Malchiah and his brethren, the chief of the fathers, 240 and 2, and Meshiah, the son of Azareel, the son of Hashai, the son of Meshilamoth, the son of Immer. The brethren, mighty men of valor, 128, and their overseer was Zadabiel, and one of the great men, and the Levites, uh, Shema, uh, and of the Levites, Shemaiah, the son of Heshub, the son of. You understand the difference between a Levite and a priest. Priests had to be direct, direct descendants of Aaron. The rest of the Levites were Levites, okay? Um, anyway, uh, Continuing uh, verse 16, that Shabbatai and Jezebad and the chief of the Levites had oversight uh, outward business of the house of God. And Mataniah, the son of Micah, the son of Zabai, the son of Asaph, was the principal to begin the thanksgiving and prayer. And Bakbukiah, the uh, second among his brethren, and Abda, the son of Shamua, the son of Galal, the son of Jedatham, all the Levites in the holy city were 200, fourscore, and four. More of the porters, Akub, Talman, and their brethren that kept the gates were in hundred and seventy and two, and the residue of Israel, of the priests, and of the Levites were in all the cities of Judah, every one in his inheritance. Now that's interesting. Everyone is on remember the Levites had forty eight cities. So even though we're focusing on Jerusalem, 
there are tribal elements scattered throughout the land in, the, in their traditional locations. But the Nethinims dwelt in Ophel. These are the servants to the temple, and they were, Ophel was the original city of David. And Zaha and Gispa were over the Nethinims. And the overseer also of the Levites in Jerusalem were Uzi, the son of Beni, and the son of Hashabiah, and the son of Methaniah, the son of Micah, and the sons of Asaph. The singers were over the business of the house of God. And it was the king's commandment concerning them that a certain portion should be for the singers due every day. Now, I think that's kind of interesting because apparently Artaxerxes has taken an interest here. And uh, he obviously is keeping track of his, his, his friend Nehemiah. But it's interesting, he apparently isn't just watching over. He apparently has issued some rules because it's the king's commandment. He made sure that the singers were taken care of. He must have liked music. Now, he's a pagan king, but he's, he's, he's the benefactor of, of uh, Nehemiah in that sense. And, and he uh, apparently has uh, put, uh, put his own uh, <laughs> requirements uh, in the hopper here. Methiah, the son of Meshezabiel, of the children of Zerah, the son of Judah, was at the king's hand in all matters concerning the people. And for the villages and their fields, some of the children of Judah dwelt at Kiriath Arba. That's the old name for Hesh- uh, Heshbon, or Hebron, I should say. Uh, and in the villages thereof, and at Dibon, and the, in the villages thereof, and at Jechabzeel, in the villages thereof, and at Jeshua, at Moladah, and at Beth Philet, and the, at uh, Hazar Shewal, and at Beersheba, and in the villages thereof, and at Ziklag, and Mekona, and in the villages thereof, and, and Rimmon, and Zeriah, and at Jarmuth. And a lot of these, the scholars don't know where they are. A lot of them can be located. I haven't bothered to keep a map because it would be pretty spotty going, but uh, for what it's worth, uh, so many of these we do, some we don't. Zenoa, Adullam, and their villages, and Lachish, and the fields thereof, and Azekah, the field, and the villages thereof, and they dwelt from Beersheba unto the valley of Hinnom. Him, Him, Valley of Hinnom was just south of Jerusalem. Beersheba is way down in the Negev. That's where the University of Ben Gurion University is located today. It's it's that's serious. You're down in serious desert there. The children of Benjamin from Geba dwelt at Michmash and Ija and Bethel in their villages, and at Anathoth, Nob, Ananiah, Hazor, Ramah, Gataim, Hadid, Zeboim, Nabalat, Lot, and Ono, the Valley of the Craftsmen. And other Levites were divisions in Judah and in Benjamin. And so ends this session. We have two chapters left with some interesting diversions from them that we will take in the next session.